Okay. Uh, so welcome everybody again to London Vegans. Um, I'll be just admitting one or two extra people into the group. For those who are watching this um, afterwards, um, you know, just say London Vegans, we have monthly meetings on the last Wednesday of the month, uh, open to everybody. Um, for tonight's meeting, we have a guest speaker, which is Tina Papadopoulou. Um, and Tina uh, is something of a specialist in relation to elephants. And we had a discussion, a group discussion, uh, a few months back about animals in captivity. And Tina very kindly offered to give a presentation specifically about elephants in captivity. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Tina to tell us more and to, to share her presentation. So thanks very, very much for agreeing to talk to us tonight, Tina. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Just let me share my screen. Yeah. OK. So you can see the graphic. Yeah. I'm just Excellent. Myself in the spotlight. Yeah. Um, Just, um, sorry, I do need one moment. Um, no. That's fine. <laughs> um, there we are. Okay. Yeah. So um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and I'd like to start with a confession. Um, this is a particularly poignant moment for me because um, I became vegan because of elephants. A tenuous connection, you might think. Um, I guess as I became more and more fascinated by elephants, it dawned on me just how humans are capable of habitual cruelty towards um, loved and special animals. Not necessarily out of malice, <clears throat> but out of ignorance or indifference or tradition. And this fueled me sufficiently to want to speak out about respecting animals. But of course, initially, um, at the time, by animals, I meant wildlife. Uh, but thankfully, the penny dropped uh, soon after that. And I recognize that, of course, compassion is unconditional to certain deserving animals, uh, or uh, all animals are deserving of compassion, though obviously elephants are extra special. So, um, yes, I'm very glad to be discussing this topic among a lot of herbivores here. Um, by means of an agenda to this discussion, um, anatomy's destiny uh, is a quote from Freud. Uh, he meant it in the context of sex, but with elephants being so unique uh, in so many ways, um, over the centuries, we, they have appealed to religion, statesmen, hunters, arts, the entertainment industry. Um, yet despite being so loved, both African and A Asian elephants are endangered, uh, and in some cases critically endangered. Um, and so the words elephants and conservation come in close succession. But it troubles me that this is in the context of their continuing use. Zoos are involved in conservation. Elephant riding safaris claim to support conservation. Um, and so I'd like to explore what this means in reality and for the elephants themselves. Um, I should also mention that the focus for this discussion is mostly Asian elephants. African ones have similar pressures, uh, but they also have some differences. So this, this is a topic for a different discussion, plus it would be very long if I covered that as well. So this is, this is roughly what we are concerned with. And please feel free to submit any questions or any comments you may have as I go along, because we touch on many, many subjects. Um, speaking about anatomy, um, obviously, elephants are big. Um, Asian elephants, males, weigh about four tons, um, females about two and a half. There are a lot of things to be said about elephant anatomy. Again, it could be a presentation in its own right. Um, I'll just mention a handful of things of interest. Um, they have a large brain, uh, probably the largest of all land mammals. Only the whale's brain is bigger. Um, it's similar to the human brain, actually, uh, but it has three times more neurons, more connections. Um, also, their temporal lobe, the front bit, is unusually large. So that could be linked to their good memory. Um, trunk uh, is a fusion of the upper lip and the nose. Um, it has 40,000 muscles and by comparison the entire human body has about 600. Um, if you see any videos of baby elephants swinging their trunks, um, that's because it's a very complex tool and they're just learning how to use it. And once they master it, they become very skilled at picking up small items and even feeling bananas. It's in Twitter recently. Uh, they use that little protrusion, the finger at the top. Uh, and it, it can be very flexible. Um, 
this is Banca's eye. Um, hopefully we'll speak about Banca later on. Um, their eye is very similar to the human one uh, in terms of structure and pigmentation. You can actually see elephants with variations in eye color. Uh, but their eyesight is bad. Uh, it has a range of about three meters and they don't have good peripheral vision, uh, which is why they may get easily startled. But they have an excellent sense of smell, which compensates. Mm, also, their foot pads, um, they're highly sensitive. Um, they, they're very special. They, they feel vibrations through the ground. And as you can see from the bone structure, they're actually walking on their toes, which is pretty spectacular given their volume. And no, they're not scared of mice, but they are scared of bees. Um, although they have a very thick skin, um, it is actually quite sensitive and they are afraid that bees might sting them. So beehives are actually used as an elephant deterrent to protect crops or cropped areas. Mm, and finally, the pub quiz question, um, who is the closest living relative to elephants? Uh, this is it, it's the rock hyrax. Uh, their common ancestor lived 60 million years ago. Um, just, just a small handful of items that I find interesting in relation to their anatomy. Um, but of course, elephants are also known for their emotional lives. Um, they know what each other is thinking. They communicate through touch and smell, um, very much like humans. They use touch for reassurance. Um, they also communicate by sound, of course. Um, they purr like cuts cats, they rumble, they trumpet, uh, they can detect rainstorms from 150 kilometers away, um, they can hear trumpeting from eight kilometers away. And we know that um, if elephants are shot in one area, um, distant groups become agitated. Um, they sense a lot more than, than we think they do. Um, they also have infrasonic communication that's below the human range, so we don't always know what they're saying. We do know that they have memories. Um, this is in Africa. Uh, these are collars that are used to track them. They belong to elephants that have passed um, and they were laid out as a museum piece. But researchers noticed that wild elephants would wander and inspect them. Uh, they would pick certain ones to interact and keep them closer. Presumably there was a connection with the previous owner of these collars and the elephants felt that, um, sensed it, smelled them. Um, of course, they're known to mourn, um, they pay respects, they even cover their dead. And the same applies to Asian elephants, it's just a picture of African here. Um, also, they know when they're looking at themselves, when they, they see themselves in the mirror. Um, this is a famous recognition test. Uh, only apes, dolphins and orca um, are known to pass this test, and we'll talk about it a little later. Magpies uh, pass the test as well, but then magpies can do many, many things. Um, and if you want to know more about elephant behavior, um, what their sounds and their various moves mean, there is an outstanding resource uh, on the internet, the Elephant Ethogram. Um, it maps hundreds of behaviors. It has short videos and sounds. It has been compiled by Cynthia Moss, who is a legendary um, elephant researcher. Uh, it's well recommended having a look if you have an interest. Um, and uh, one last slide on general elephant uh, behavior. They're very social. Um, they live in families. Um, they're led by the oldest female, it's called the matriarch. They also have extended families, bond groups, clans. Um, they have a long, long gestation period of 22 months. And raising calves is an intricate business, uh, very much like toddlers. They have to learn everything, um, discipline, play, safety, how to socialize the very important elephant etiquette. Um, they're very polite creatures. And this education lasts well into their teens. And we will see later is detrimental when that bond is broken. Um, when babies are orphaned, they suffer not just from loss of nutrition, uh, but also from the trauma and the grief from having been separated from their family. Uh, males leave their family when they become annoying teenagers, when they're about 10 or 15 years old, and they tend to wander in bachelor herds with other males where they learn male elephant etiquette. Um, it is important to mention that a lot of knowledge resides with the older elephants, the matriarchs and the bulls. Um, they know when to travel, they have experience navigating, finding food, water, dealing with dangers and obstacles and so on. 
So it really is detrimental for the whole herd when the connection is broken and when elephants are poached. There is loads more to say because they are truly wonderful, but um, moving on to our topic. Um, humans like to appropriate things that are special um, and there is an awful lot of iconography when it comes to elephants. Um, this is a text from an Indian book of law, uh, elephant law. Um, I like the last bit, elephants should be protected like the life of a king. Um, this implied symbiosis between elephants are, and rulers is not necessarily untrue, but I would say that humans have generally protected elephants only in order to use them in some way. And we typically use them to glorify ourselves. Um, this has been happening for the past 5,000 years. And even to this day, I, I heard the elephant whisperer won the Oscars this year. Um, now, this is not to say there is no compassion and caring in human-elephant relations, but there is almost always a subtext of chains and cages and a sharp bullhook. Um, even this picture, you can see the, the rider, the handler, the mahout, as it's called, he's holding a sharp stick. Um, it's called a bullhook. And the elephant has chains in his legs. So they, they you know, we love them, but we also control them. Um, Talking about using elephants, uh, here is Hannibal, famously riding an elephant across the Alps. Um, it should be mentioned that he was one of the least successful elephant generals. Um, all of his 37 elephants perished. Um, elephants were used in battles, uh, Roman times, but it was deemed too much of a double-edged sword. Um, but they were used extensively by kings and successors to, I guess, incorporate the beast, um, both actually and metaphorically. Um, into their expressions of power, not just in antiquity, but in modern history too. Uh, this is Lord Curzon uh, taking office as a Viceroy of India. And this is Captain John Grant uh, riding an elephant before uh, Vietnamese villagers. He transported two elephants by cargo plane. But of course, to use elephants, first they have to be caught. And um, this is almost always ugly. Um, this is actually a nice picture. It's one of the first elephant images published in the National Geographic in 1906. And you can see this is a captive elephant herding wild ones um, to be taken to be, to be used by the king. This process is called keda, the process of trapping elephants. And it has always been cruel and perilous with very high attrition rates for the elephants and the humans. Um, the British had appointed an officer in charge of the, um, it was called the Government Elephant Catching Establishment. Um, and clearly this was being done on an industrial scale across Southeast Asia. Most of the fair elephants who were captured and were tamed and didn't die in the process, um, they were used locally, but a few of them were imported across the empire and beyond. Um, as part of menageries and circuses and zoos. Um, you can just about discern some of the bewildered Victorian looks here in these pictures. And during the wars, uh, the elephants were repurposed. Uh, at the top here is Lizzie, the elephant, um, transporting steel around Sheffield. She, she became very famous. Um, this is an elephant from Sangar Circus in Horley in Surrey, uh, plowing fields. And this is Jenny from Berlin Zoo. Um, she was redeployed in Hamburg um, to clear rubble from the streets. By the mid 1800s, um, there was a global animal trade network um, with a distribution center. One was in Hamburg and the other one was in Italy. And in the US, an elephant could fetch something like 6,000 US dollars. Um, although actually I should say baby hippos were deemed more valuable and they were much harder to catch and transport. Um, initially, the animals were displayed, but then eventually they participated in circus acts and Barnum Circus was a very well known one. Jumbo was a famous elephant and he had a terrible history like all of them, uh, and even worse death. But uh, Barnum had another Indian elephant. Uh, it was called Pilot and um, male elephants are harder to train. Um, they go through a phase uh, where their hormones are running high, it's called must, and they become more unpredictable and aggressive. Um, it's described as basically having a massive hangover. And it lasts between two to three months and it happens every year or so. Um, Pilot was deemed naturally vicious and treacherous. And so after a performance, he misbehaved. 
And when conventional beatings didn't work, he was executed. Um, at the time, uh, this act was called out by Berg. Um, if you don't know who Ernest Berg is, I thoroughly recommend um, reading this book, uh, Traitor to His Species. Uh, it's about the onset of animal rights in the US um, and the role this man played. It's a super, super fascinating read. Um, and he actually, uh, he published this article where he said that these wonderful creatures, if they cannot be controlled humanely, then they should never be taken from their na native homes. And to this day, I wish more people would hear this. Um, back in their native homes, uh, captured elephants didn't fare much better, of course. Um, once they were used extensively in logging, here is one in Myanmar in the center. Um, this was particularly grueling work for them, uh, very high mortality and injury rate. Uh, logging was banned in Thailand in 1989. Um, it wasn't because of elephant welfare, it was because of floods. Um, but there is still very much illegal logging going on. Elephants have been and continue to be used um, to bless devotee, uh, devotees in temples. Um, they're kept tethered in isolation for, well, years. Um, they're also used in religious ceremonies. Here is one in Kerala. Um, there are others happening in Sri Lanka. Um, these are particularly torturous for elephants because the conditions they're kept, um, they're ke exposed to crowds, explosions, fireworks, heavy loads, all sorts of stuff that spook them out. Um, and they're not allowed to be elephants, which adds to their stress. And you may read that sometimes they do lash out into the crowd and it has detrimental consequences. Um, they're also used to beg on the streets, uh, less so nowadays. This is Lexmi. Uh, she was uh, 32 years old and collapsed on the road and died from cardiac arrest about three years ago. Um, and of course, they're still used in tourism to give rides and add folklore to people's pictures and selfies. Um, this just scratches the surface of how humans see elephants. Um, so I guess just from this, this whistle stop, uh, one could deduce that riding elephants is, is natural. Um, we've always done it this way. You could say it's normal. Uh, it's part of our culture. Um, it's embedded in so many practices and imagery. It's even necessary. Um, in carrying logs in the jungle without using machinery and disturbing vegetation. And it's nice. Elephants are majestic and riding one is in so many people's bucket list. But of course, I think this audience might recognize the fallacy of the four ends um, that is used to justify so many things such as meat consumption. Um, in fact, there is nothing natural, there is nothing normal, and it's most definitely not nice from the elephant's perspective. Oops, sorry, um, sorry, skipped. Um, elephants are meant to live in families in the forest doing elephant things. Um, I've just shown you pictures of elephants alone, even babies alone here. Uh, their movements are controlled. Um, there is nothing natural about this. Um, but in looking beneath the surface, um, what does it take to train an elephant? What does it take to ride them? You are welcome to Google it and see all the painful imagery and descriptions. Um, it is too upsetting for me, uh, and I haven't included any of this here. It's too graphic. Uh, but if you search what is Pajan, um, it's mentioned here, Pajan, you will see for yourselves. Um, we talked previously that baby elephants learn how to be elephants from their mothers and their families. So the purpose of training is to break this bond and to get the elephant to obey human command. Um, so they're separated at the age of two or three. They're put in a wooden box or tied on a very short chain and they're restricted. Um, they're starved, um, they are deprived, they are well, beaten uh, really quite brutally. And at the end of their process, they're basically stripped of their will. Um, they have no confidence to do anything without a human telling them that it's okay to do so. Um, the elephants obey not because they love humans, but because they remember what will happen to them if they don't obey. Now, theoretically, and in some instances, this could be done humanely through positive enforcement, for example. But in 99% of the cases, this is the quickest and the easiest way 
through dominance um, and pain and fear, especially where there is money to be made. And you can imagine um, just how damaging this is for the elephants. Um, this is uh, some of the tools of the trade. Um, this is a wall at uh, Wildlife SOS in India. These are the typical instruments they use. It's called a bull hook. And it's got a spike and a, and a hook. Um, it's used to tear flesh and dig into the bone. Um, knives are used for stabbing. Uh, these are chains to tie around the ankles. And if you look, they have um, um, nails that dig into the skin when they're tugged. This is all standard. Um, used nowadays. Um, the elephant tourism business is a lucrative one and there is a lot of obfuscation um, and so I'm just going to go through some of those myths that are often mentioned just to avoid any confusion. Um, when elephants are described as domesticated people think that they're like dogs and horses and this isn't the case. Domesticated means that a species has been selectively bred for generations to have a particular trait or a behavior. Effectively, they've undergone intentional genetic changes. But elephants have long gestation periods and they don't breed in captivity. So it's always quicker to either take them from the wild or to use male bulls to impregnate captive females. Um, so it's not easy to control their characteristics. So even if born in captivity, elephants remain wild. Um, you can see how they behave, even young ones. They are hyperactive, they're like toddlers. And you will quickly see that tamed ones are docile and calm. But that's because of coercion and fear. This is not domestication. Um, Sometimes you will see that uh, there are responsible elephant rides or shows. This is not the case. There are no responsible rides or shows. Um, aside from the cruelty involved in breaking the elephant, um, their physical well being is damaged by the jobs they're asked to do. They may be large and strong, but their backs are not built for loads. Um, the saddle and the weight of the passengers can cause injuries. Uh, circus tricks are, they are forced to do, they damage their bones. Um, in most of these facilities, they're chained for long periods of time between rides, and this causing, causing them stress, and you can see them swaying. Um, this is an expression of extreme anguish. Um, it, they, they, uh, these venues don't really care about elephant welfare. Um, reproduction, th there's another one that they contribute to conservation, and we will talk a lot more about this topic. That's That's the main of the conversation, uh, but reproduction rates of captive elephants are extremely low. So elephants are actually poached from the wild to add to tourist entertainment, so the opposite. Um, in Southeast Asia, they're livestock. Um, they're owned and they're seen in a, as an investment. They cost up to $40,000 US dollars. It depends on age and gender, but this is market economy. This is not conservation. Um, People will often say that these elephants are rescued from logging. Um, logging was banned in 1989, as we said. Yes, a lot of owners use tourism as a source of income, but that was 35 years ago. Logging elephants are compromised and they're now old or they have died. Um, but the number of tourist venues with elephants has grown. Um, it's hard to validate, but about 75% of adult elephants used for tourist rides today have been caught from the wild. Um, so it is, it's an excuse. Tourists want rides. Yes, the tide is shifting in Europe, uh, but there is still a steady demand from other regions. Uh, and a lot of venues are rebranding to call themselves sanctuaries and instead uh, offer bathing or close interactions. But be sure, there is very little difference. Elephants don't want to bathe on demand. and The living conditions remain the same for them. Um, I would like to think that when humans, when people become aware of their suffering, um, their enthusiasm for riding wanes or should diminish. Uh, there's an excellent campaign by uh, an Indian NGO uh, called Wildlife SOS. They're based in India. It's called Refuse to Ride. And they go around uh, uh, posting these, uh, these, these, these campaigns on Indian trains targeting tourists and locals. Um, 
Of course, it's understandable to want to see elephants, and there are still few opportunities to see them in their natural habitats, but it's shrinking. Um, and speaking about natural habitats, this is, of course, the story of our times. Um, there are fewer than 50,000 wild Asian elephants, um, and they're classified as endangered, which means that more than 50% of their population has reduced in the last uh, three decades, three generations, sorry. So that's a significant reduction. And it's much lower than the African elephants, which number just over 350,000. Uh, you can see in this picture, the red, uh, if you can't read it, is the, um, the uh, illegal causes of death. Uh, so really quite significant. Um, the main pressures are like, like with most animals, habitat loss and fragmentation, human elephant conflict when they go into fields and they damage crops. Um, poaching, uh, poaching for Asian elephants too, not just ivory, but their skin as well is used in misguided medicine. Um, and of course, fragmented populations in countries such as Vietnam, populations are thought to be down to double digits. And Sumatran elephants are critically endangered for quite some time. Oh, sorry, have been critically endangered since 2012, I think. Um, so what can we do about it? And of course, the obvious answer is conserve their land, create corridors and let them be wild. But in the context of this discussion, um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, um, there are about 15 to 20,000 Asian elephants in captivity. So can they play a role in conservation? We're often told that captive elephants help with conservation efforts. So I'm just, I'd like to know why and how. Um, and could captive breeding uh, provide an insurance against extinction? If we look at captive elephants within their native range first, so this is in situ conservation um, for, for those captive elephants specifically, um, we've already said that most of them belong to private owners uh, or used in tourism or in temples, and they are unlikely to play any role in conservation whatsoever. Some could say that um, they're culturally irrelevant, they're a source of national pride, it may foster positive attitudes, and this has some indirect conservation benefit, but that's virtually impossible to substantiate. Um, some elephants, however, belong to governments and uh, they may be used for anti-poaching and arguably this has been the most positive impact on conservation. There are examples in Kasiranga in India and Chitwan in Nepal um, where previously decimated rhino populations have bounced back because the park allows elephants to be used for anti-poaching patrols. And also the elephant back safaris provide conservation income. Um, this, is, um, this is my picture, I'm sandwiched between the two elephants and that makes it possible to get really close to the rhinos. Uh, the, the elephant is ridden by a mahout on their back, obviously not by tourists. This was a specifically selected venue for that reason. Um, the rhinos don't attack the elephants and so therefore, Therefore, they, 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 they smell the elephants rather than the tourists and they don't attack. So you can get quite close. And that's how they attract visitors to the park. I would argue that sacrificing the well-being of one species for another is just as unethical. Um, but I will leave it up to you to make that moral judgment. Um, I'd say true in situ conservation is about rehabilitating and releasing animals into the wild. And to the best of my knowledge, this is only done in Africa. I would love to hear if you have any examples in Asia as well. There are enough examples and research to show that it is possible they can be rewilded. Uh, captive elephants too, they can be rehabilitated to live independently. But the issue is that their land has to be protected. Mm. I have only come across one example that offers a glimmer of hope for rewilding. Um, it's the Gentle Giants, it's a non-profit organization. Um, these are still captive elephants. Uh, the owners of these elephants used to work in camps. They went back to their villages during COVID. Um, the Gentle Giants support them to stay there and you can visit and see the elephants foraging in the forest from a safe distance. 
and you can see them doing elephant things, not not doing things on command. Um, they are not wild, um, but they live a semi-wild existence during the day. And in the future, there might be an opportunity to rewild them. Um, there are a couple more organizations that follow this model, uh, Never Forget Foundation and Mahouts.org. Uh, but there are many, many, many more gimmicks. And here is one. Um, Thai Elephant Conservation Center. Um, I, I actually, I know where this is. It's close to Chiang Mai, uh, Northern Thailand. Um, this is, if you read here, they do pioneering work in conservation and they proudly house uh, 10 white elephants. Now, white elephants are, it's a recessive gene. gene. There is precisely zero, con zero conservation benefit to keep them. It is purely for the glory of, of whatever the situation is. Um, they are captive elephants and nothing more. If you look at this picture closely, you will see young children on the necks of elephants. Um, I would argue if these elephants are operating out of their own accord, this is extremely dangerous. Um, the girl is playing with the elephant's trunk and you can see the mahout here holding a bull hook. Um, so these elephants are being ridden, but not with a saddle, just, just, just like that. And it didn't take me long, just one of the comments underneath. Um, our son had his own elephant. Uh, I hope he also had an insurance. Uh, he spent the day training with elephants and performing for the tourists, so clearly they're used for shows. Uh, in the afternoons, you tether the elephants and go home for relaxing. Presumably that's the humans, the elephants stay tethered, and they carry on the next day. Um, again, I leave it up to you to decide if the treatment of these 50 elephants as toys can be justified in the name of a vague conservation claim. Here's another one that angered me. Uh, this is a, a gap, it's a website that organizes gap years for students. Um, Elephant Conservation Project. Um, this is actually Pinawala. Uh, if you look for Pinawala, um, it's uh, absolutely not a conservation center. Uh, it has orphans that have been taken from the wild, but there is absolutely no chance that they will ever be released. They will either entertain tourists or be sold off. Um, you can see bathing, as I mentioned, elephants don't need to be bathed. Um, this is an elephant in total submission. And you can see the mahout, if you squint, uh, he has a knife on his belt. And here he is being poked with spikes and he's got chains around his neck. Um, there is nothing conservation about this. Um, and moving away from these examples, there's a considerable number of sanctuaries that have sprung up. Um, it's difficult to avoid the sense that these elephants are being exploited for entertainment, whatever the educational or conservation arguments are, or at least the elephants are helping to pay for themselves for their upkeep. Pausing for breath, um, this was um, conservation in situ, which again, if you have better examples, I'd love to hear them. I haven't come across many. Um, Ex situ conservation. So this is uh, conservation by organizations that keep elephants outside of their native range. So we're talking zoos. Um, there are more than a thousand elephants in zoos around the world. Um, China don't release their numbers. I suspect it would be significantly higher if they did. There are 622 captive elephants in Europe and 51 in the UK. 28 solitary elephants and in Europe and two in the UK. And I cannot emphasize just how cruel this is for an elephant. Um, there is plenty of evidence to show that elephants suffer in zoos. Um, zoos can't possibly mimic their wild habitats. They don't offer social opportunities. Um, it's so essential to elephants. Uh, two reports uh, were released recently in the UK one was by Born Free and another one by the Conservative Animal Welfare Foundation. And they're very clear, elephants do not belong in captivity and should be phased out. And even IASA, which is the Association for Zoos and Aquaria, Aquaria um, they recognize that even the basic standards they set are a far cry from what elephants need to thrive. And just some numbers to make it obvious, 
Um, they die much younger in captivity, uh, 20 years as opposed to 60, 70. Um, the enclosures are several orders of magnitude smaller than what they would normally use. They're rarely kept in family groups, um, and quite a lot of them, like 78% of them, will be transferred at least once in their lifetime. Um, this plus the confinement, it increases stress. Um, elephants um, it shows incompatibilities, and there are several instances of aggressive behavior, and even deaths as a result of elephants attacking each other. This is extremely unusual in the wild. Elephants are peaceful animals, but this is what captivity does to them. Infant mortality and stillbirths is significantly higher, and this is because females are bred so much younger. And also, elephants carry a virus a gene for a virus, um, EEHV. Uh, it is latent in, cap in populations, but in captivity, it tends to express itself and elephants die of hemorrhage. This does not stop elephants from continuing to breed babies, of course. Um, I don't know what is the legal position uh, for this, but Chester Zoo, um, uh, they, they have five elephants that have died to this disease in the space of six years. But babies are popular. So th these impoverished and stressful conditions lead to psychological damage, stereotypic behavior, where the elephant repeats the same movements. They're effectively going mad. And it can regularly be seen in, in zoos. Um, and uh, this was a special slide for John. Um, uh, just to clarify here, um, safari parks are no better than zoos. They are zoos. Um, they expose animals to after-hours parties. Animals perform in shows. Animals are bred and they're killed if they're bred to excess or if they have characteristics that are undesirable. And these are not just a few bad apples or bad press. I don't know if you know Hopefield, which is a farm animal sanctuary in Brentford. They have a number of exotic uh, pets that have been discarded. So they were obliged to apply for a zoo license. But with the license came obligations, zoo obligations, which were really quite unfathomable for a sanctuary. Um, and therefore, they declined the, um, the application. And instead, the exotic animals are kept indoors. They're not exhibited. And you often hear the argument that, um, but I can't travel to Africa, and that's my best chance of seeing an elephant. Um, yeah, this was um, um, this is a safari park in the UK that supports unprotected contact with elephants. Therefore, the elephants are dominated. You can see them with a bull hook. You can see keepers with a bull hook. And it costs 640 odd pounds for two people. Um, and that's the standard price, it's not VIP. VIP. So it is quite expensive um, as it is. Uh, I would like to just discuss this special case uh, briefly. Um, Happy. Happy um, is a wild born elephant, uh, was wild born in Thailand in the 70s. And she was captured and imported to the US, and she was sold. Uh, for $800 to a safari park, um, along with six other calves. Um, they were distributed across zoos and circuses, and Happy was sent to the Bronx Zoo. Um, they have all died since. Um, through the 80s, Happy uh, gave rides and did other entertainment tricks. Her trainer mentioned that she was a very active elephant, so she was given physical tasks, like standing in her hind legs and standing up and all those things. Um, in 2005, uh, Happy became the first elephant to pass the mirror self-recognition test that we saw earlier. It's considered an indicator of self-awareness. Um, and Happy is now 49 years old. Mm, she's been living alone for 14 years in a one-acre enclosure. Um, it's a bleak bamboo-shrouded exhibit. They call it Without Irony Wild Asia. There's another elephant at the zoo. They can see each other, but they don't interact. Um, they swap them between indoors and outdoors. Um, what's interesting about this case, um, Happy is also the client of the Non-Human Rights Project. Um, it's a civil rights organization in the US, and it's dedicated to the rights of non-human animals. And uh, 
recently they brought this case, uh, I would argue is the most important animal rights case this century. Um, they argued that she should be released from the zoo and sent to a sanctuary, not on the grounds of welfare. Um, they're not saying that the zoo is not looking after happy, but because she deserves to be granted personhood. Now, personhood is a very specific legal term. It doesn't equate to human. It describes um, a legal entity with rights and duties um, that can enter into contracts, be sued, own property, and so on. And so personhood may be assigned to humans, to companies, to ships, places of interest. Um, it was recently assigned to um, a river, Klamath River. It belongs to the First Nation um, um, tribe. But can an elephant be a person? And this is not a frivolous question. Um, we live at a time of mass extinctions and catastrophic climate change, as we see. And arguably, we should be asking if our legal framework can handle these issues. The Non-Human Rights Project have argued that science and human experience tell us that elephants are autonomous animals. They're cognitively, emotionally, socially complex. They exercise free will and they make choices about their lives just as humans do. And forcing an elephant like Happy to be alone in a natural environment is causing her suffering. So they asked the Bronx Zoo to send Happy to a dedicated sanctuary that is similar to her natural environment where she can live freely and with other animals, sorry, with other elephants specifically. But the court said no. Um, they dismissed the case on some technicalities and how is a sanctuary different from a zoo? The answer is very. Um, in the end, it seems that this take on animals and our responsibilities towards them is just too radical and no one is prepared to shake the house or the, the legal construct. And this subheading says it all, uh, if you can read it, um, a decision in favor of happy would have had enormous destabilizing impact on modern society. And yes, uh, it was said that uh, this would be really bad for the dairy industry. Uh, good old dairy industry has a saying this too. Um, I guess in the wild, elephants are keystone species. And if, if it falls, then entire ecosystems can collapse. And similarly in courts, Elephant personhood is a keystone argument, uh, is an argument on which other animal rights and even environmental arguments could conceivably depend. Um, I'd like you to hold this thought. We'll come back to it in a moment. Um, because I'm talking about how captivity can support conservation objectives, it gets a little tricky. Um, because Bronx Zoo is actually owned by the Wildlife Conservation Society. And this is one of the very, very few organizations with active projects to protect wild habitats. Many places will say they support conservation, but I would urge you to just investigate the credibility of these claims. Um, but they also led a campaign, the 96 elephants, which contributed to the near total ban of ivory sales in the US. Um, they, they, they were also called out for human rights abuses in Congo and their CEO is being paid more than a million. But again, I will leave it up to you to decide if their contribution is worth the suffering of not just happy, but setting a precedent for thousands of animals in captivity. Personally, I cannot see why progressive organizations cannot take a stance and move towards models that don't exploit animals while still generating revenue for their causes, if they're truly serious about the causes. Um, back to Happy for just one moment. Um, when the decision was made on Happy, um, there were some supplementary opinions um, that were submitted by the judges. And I selected this existential question from one of the um, one of these statements. Um, one of the judges asked, um, at some point, the courts have to decide 
how to treat non-human animals. In the eyes of the law, should they be a person or a thing? And the same question uh, was asked by another judge in Islamabad. And I found his, um, his judgment particularly enlightening. He, he said, he wrote in his, uh, in, in his paper, um, do animals have legal rights? And the answer is yes, because they're living beings. And therefore they have the right to live in an environment that meets their needs. And so with this decision from this Islamabad um, judge, three months later, a 33 year old male elephant, his name is Kavan, he was taken out of Islamabad Zoo. Um, he was put on a diet first, and then he was loaded into a crate and then a plane. And he was flown to a sanctuary in Cambodia where he has his own piece of jungle and a swimming pool and two other elephants to interact if he chooses to. So far, they're only touching and sharing meals, but they haven't spent time together. So this is what could be done if we have a bit more imagination uh, about keeping animals in our care in the century. And uh, I will close with Banka, uh, who is an elephant very close to our hearts. Um, so Banka is a male elephant. Um, she, he lives in, in Yerevan. He's very young. He's 15 years old. And uh, a friend of mine, Mark Stratton, who should be on this call, um, uh, we run a campaign to uh, convince Yerevan Zoo to release him from, uh, from this really horrible, sanctuary, uh, horrible enclosure and to let him go and join Kavan in Cambodia. Um, this is a very short clip to end with, and you will hear Mark's voice narrating. Uh, this is Banka. We can't hear the sound on that one. Ah, apologies. Uh, uh, apologies, if you can't hear it, that's fine. Okay. But you get the idea. Uh, Banka is, um, lives in a really barren enclosure, uh, very small, no water, uh, no stimulation. And despite um, his very young age, He's uh, already suffering um, the effects of captivity. She's got broken nails. She's under. He's underweight. Um, um, we've done. We've had a. We we organized uh, an independent scientific assessment of his condition, uh, physical and physiological. It was quite damning. Um, you can check. You can check our progress. And if you if you want, you can sign our campaign on change.org. Um, uh, the website is uh, freebanker.com. Um, I will stop sharing. Um, there are as many slides to go on, but I will stop. Um, thank you ever so much, Tina. I mean, what that's done for me particularly is, uh, is I knew it, something about elephants, but that's actually filled in the gaps and answered some of those questions that I was asking. When, when, in other words, well, one of the examples was, you know, can elephants be raised um, and conditioned in a more humane way, which obviously they're not. I mean, the, the use of the bull hooks, et cetera. Um, I, I, I'm just saying you didn't cover, but I mean, I know there's a lot of abuse of, of elephants, particularly that has been in the circuses. Uh, there has been in terms of uh, poaching for elephants for their tusks, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the, the elephants really had a you know, really bad time over the course of many years through exploitation in, in different ways. Uh, but so thank you for, for sharing. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can either raise your hand um or you can um post a question um i've got paul do you want to uh, can i have this spotlight if i may hi there uh, my question is about um, infrasound that elephants use mm -hmm. now i understand that um it was recently a few years ago it was discovered that they communicate quite long distances using um sound of extremely low frequency um, can you say anything about um, what is known about what information they communicate in that way? How they communicate actually using the infrasound? Um, I, I'm afraid uh, I haven't studied the subject. What I do know is that um, they, they communicate emotions as well as facts. 
um, mm -hmm. and it is a combination of the, the ground vibration, so the signals they get through their feet, uh, a combination of smell, uh, which is acute, plus the, the, the rumbling and the communication. I, I'm afraid I can't help you anymore on that. Um, I, haven't, um, I haven't studied the subject to that depth. Uh -huh. um, it, it, in what way do they, um, I mean, is obviously any creature can express emotion to um, a fellow who is nearby. Mm. How do they communicate that at a distance? Um, through smell. Um, so um, they, they are able, so if you, if, you, um, if you look at the way they interact, uh, when they want to interact and exchange information, they will actually urinate and they, they release hormones from their temporal glands. So there are so many different triggers and through that they understand their gender, they understand their mood, they understand their health conditions even. So right. there are so many signals that they perceive uh, that they combine it to do what we call communication. Uh -huh. that, that explains something that I saw in a video on YouTube that I watched recently mm -hmm. where a, a herd of elephants approached a, um, um, a baby elephant that had been um, abandoned in some way and it was mentioned in the um, description of the video somebody pointed out that the two um, elder females um, they urinated when they approached this baby and so they were actually communicating with yeah. the elephant that wasn't made clear in the video in the description that they were actually doing that as a form of communication absolutely yeah and they through that they 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 express the, the other elephants can understand what they're thinking at the time how they're feeling uh, and and what is the position like the stress levels the st stress hormones that's what those those smells contain thanks paul right. thank you for that one uh, joanne are you okay for me to highlight you Okay? Um, I want to know is what I want to know is how we can um, stop the ecotourism thing with elephants because I've watched a couple of um, documentaries on Animal Planet and um, it showed the uh, elephants that have been in um, the logging um, trade for a long time. They've got serious psychological and mental um problems because of it and um i know some of the mahouts have died but so like you said in the video in the talk that a lot of elephants have died so i just want to know how we can stop it because i don't want to i'm an animal lover myself and i do belong to the world animal protection society mm -hmm. and i just think it's like um, I don't understand why they say, oh, they don't have feelings, they don't have emotions. And I also wanted to know what we can get done about our animal welfare laws to do with an elephants and safaris and um, zoos, because it seems to me if a human hurts a person, they get put in prison for a long time. So maybe it should be the same if you hurt an animal, doesn't matter what animal it is. Thanks for the question, Joanne. Tina. Yeah. Uh, what, what we can do, I think, um, look, for a lot of people, and I include myself uh, several years ago, I didn't know. I didn't know this is what it takes in order for an elephant to become rideable. Now I do. And um, all I can do is shout from the rooftops um, and, and say to as many people as I can who want, and even those who don't want to hear, I still say it, that um, this, this, is, this, is, this is damaging. And do you realize what it means for them? And crucially, as I said before, it's not just riding, um, it's also bathing. It's any kind of close contact. Uh, they are wild, very powerful animals. And where you see instances where humans are allowed close to them, um, where they are dominated in any way, there is no um, compassionate way of doing this, basically. So really, just educate, telling people this is the case is, is the best thing we can hope for. And the penny, the, the message is getting across, I think, in a lot of cases in Europe, but there is a global market that is so much harder to control. I would have thought if you 
any of you come across any adverts for UK companies promoting mm -hmm. um, rides on elephants um, and that sort of thing, then obviously contact those companies and say, I won't be traveling with you because you're using elephants uh, from, you know, in, in a way which is um, A, unnatural, and B, there's, it causes some harm to the elephants in, in the process of taming them. So I, I would say contact those companies and just make your views known. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. And actually, when I, I started off doing this a few years back, and uh, you, you'd be amazed, there are actually insurance uh, companies as well that offer protection for riding because every now and again, elephants can't take it anymore and they yeah. flip and all they have to do is shake their head. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? If you have, just you can raise your hand or post a question in the discussion. I can't see anything in the discussion at the moment. I don't know if there's anything online. Um, if not, we will wind up the formal part of the meeting. Um, could I ask another question? Yeah, sure. Um, there was mention of um, elephants kept in zoos. You are frequently solitary. Yes, well, not frequently, um, but yes, they can be. Um, well, I'm just remembering myself that I come from New Zealand and the local zoo that was in Wellington, there was one elephant that was kept on its own. And uh, I remember thinking that it must be terribly lonely. Now, um, I was just wondering, supposing you encounter an elephant in a situation like that where it is solitary, is it good to approach it and just acknowledge that it is in this lonely state or how, how, what would be a good way of responding if you see an elephant in that kind of condition? So you mean from the elephant's perspective? Well, uh, what, what would be a good response from a human to encounter discovering here is an elephant which must be distressed because it is alone because there is no elephant for company? So I can, I mean, the, not that this, this, yeah, so, this was exactly what happened with Banka. Um, Mark traveled to Yerevan, um, saw Banka on his own uh, in a despondent, lethargic mood. Um, the elephants are so accustomed to humans coming and going. Yes, of course, they perceive us. Um, they do see us, they do smell us. Um, but after so many years of humans coming and going, I can't, I don't know if they acknowledge us, if they sense that you, 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 you saw him. You felt or for the elephant, um, but the the main thing then to do is to ask the zoo and let the zoo know that this is unacceptable. Yeah, uh, that there is thinking of that. Yeah, there is enough research that has been done that shows that the you know the elephants will not last long. They suffer. They they, they will die uh, a, a quicker and more painful and miserable death. Uh, mm. A lot of zoos know about it. In fairness. Um, I think if they are members of a global zoo network association, um, they, there are standards um, and the standards are very clear that elephants should not be kept alone. Um, now, this is a, a self-governing body, um, uh, International Association of Zoo and Aquaria. So will they kick a member out if they do this? Doubtful. Um, but it definitely counts against them. So something to show to the zoo that people recognize that this is not acceptable. Um, I have done this with a, a really criminal case in, uh, in, uh, in Cyprus. Um, uh, they, they actually have a baby elephant on her own. They imported two from Bangladesh um, and one of them died. And now it's, uh, she, she's in her, I think, four or five years old on her own. Uh, this is this is criminal, really. Um, so, um, Thanks, I'm just, from... just final question from Joanne, and then we'll wind up. I think you had your hand. Up. Um, what I wanted to know is why, um, when some elephants are being orphaned, that it takes them a long time to like um, integrate into their own herd when they're going back into the wild. Because I've watched the um, documentaries with the David Shepherd Foundation and the Sheldrake Foundation, and they say it can take a long while because they 
um, don't adapt to being in the pens by the rangers, looked after them because they're still um, very traumatised after being, after being left alone, after being separated from their mothers, like the mothers killed for um, purposes. Right. So they are definitely, uh, so they are traumatized. I think that was the point I made. It's not just about losing nutrition or body condition. It is about the emotions of the stress and the anguish, especially if their mother has died and they've seen them dead. They absolutely know what is happening. So when they're then taken and tried to be raised by humans, humans can only do so much. Um, yes, they will sense the love. They will sense the comfort. They will get food. Uh, but ultimately, elephants need other elephants to help socialize and to help them heal. So that's why you mentioned Sheldrake. You will see that most of these organizations, Reteti is another excellent one in northern Kenya. Um, they have herds of baby elephants of different ages, um, and they have time to socialize, interact, and gradually learn to be independent. And they go through a much longer process. Uh, it depends on the nature of that re-socialization. Reteti tends to be shorter, is about five years. After about five years of keeping them in an orphan herd, then they're released in an environment where they're collared and left to, to fend for themselves. What tends to happen uh, with those orphaned elephants um, is they tend to form their own herd. So um, they recognize that they all have the same background and they stick together. So orphan herds adopt other orphan herds. Back to that point about recognition, they recognize that they have been through the same trauma and that binds them. Thank you ever so much for that, Tina. We're gonna wind up the meeting, a formal part of the meeting. Now. Formal part of the meeting now. I'll get some feedback. I'll get some feedback. Okay. Okay. Um, um, thank, you. thank you ever so much, ever so much. for presenting to us. Presenting to us. Sorry, can you mute your uh, mute, Tina? I have. I'm not quite sure what happened there. I I, I thought I'd unmute everybody, but uh, just a <coughs> round of applause. But thank you very much. I'll give you a round. Pleasure. Thank you. Back at the end. Yeah. Um, let thank me. You. Let me. Thank you. Let me just, thank you. Let me just stop the recording.